You do know, and now I didn't know that, but What's a friend that? of mine told me the other day, you know, a few suicides have been happening in our community, in the UK, and in the US. The community. Yeah, 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 yeah. Okay. Yeah, whether it's in the US or in the UK, um, a lot of suicides happening. What's interesting is that it reminded me of, um, if you, you know, sometimes you read the news, you watch the news, in Iraq, a lot of suicides are happening. Now, I can understand in Iraq, you know, why it may happen. Um, you know, there's lots of issues going on there, whether it's political, whether it's social, whether it's... Um, it's yeah, yeah, but, you know, when you think of, you know, the youth that we grew up around and the society that we live in and, you know, we live in a modern society, we live in a modern country, there's a system in place, we have lots of leisure, but somehow they ended up Bro, it doesn't matter about I don't understand. Why leisure do or money or uh, how developed this country is, there are social issues that are um, constant throughout the whole world people go through. I think one of the things you need to do, think about, in Iraq there's bullying, in America there's bullying, in the UK there's bullying, in India there's bullying. There's going to be bullying everywhere for young children, do you know what I'm saying? Yeah. Um, secondly, life, even for people who are multi-millionaires, life turns bad, and sometimes when life turns bad for whatever the reason they need is, a pill the to reason sleep, might be bro. different. They need a pill to sleep, do you know yeah. what I'm saying? I remember I used to work a, in a pharmacy, and they used to talk to me about some stories about people who would like literally throw money at <clears throat> doctors just to get them to give them sleeping medication. Yeah, yeah. And I was like, what are we talking about? They're like, we're talking about big money. So I was like, obviously these people are rich. They're like, you think they have the whole world, mm. but they can't sleep. That, that people sometimes, they take yeah. these kind of things yeah. into uh, to for granted, even sleeping. Yeah. I read an article. Sleeping is a I big an, net, man. I read an article of a day that is for you. And the I Mental mean. Health <laughs> Institute uh, did a study, yeah. uh, and one in four people in the UK actually has depression. One in four. Yeah, one yeah. In four. Well, that's a huge 25%. number, by the way. Twenty-five percent. So it's a big, big one number. One in four people have depression. There's, a, there's, a, there's thing as well. You have depression. You never say I have depression, not even to yourself. You don't. And another, another thing is, you never tell people. S saying to someone as an advice, bro, you need to go see a psychiatrist. I've realized the f the main reaction is when I was working in youth affairs. I'm not mental. I'm not mental. I'm not mental. I'm. Not. No one's saying you're mental. Mm. You just need someone to talk to. You. No, no, I'm not mental. They, th they think it's, oh, yeah, there's, there's this kind of, yeah, there's, 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 there's a social awkwardness about it, you know? It does. It's, it's, it's an illness, just like anything else, right? You know, I well, who wants to prove, that, uh, who wants to uh, uh, admit that they're ill? You know, I, I would always say, you know, for example, uh, you know, let's say I have a cold, I have a cold, yeah. or I've got an ulcer, or I've got, <coughs> why can't I say, yeah, I don't have to share it with people. But why can't I just admit it to myself? It might you be easier. Something think, funny. It's, it's easier said than done, by the way. One in four people are depressed. One in four. Thank you very much. It's actually quite... <laughs> it's funny how you mentioned that one in four is, is depressed, but I think for... Especially for the Muslim girls, mainly girls, in, in the UK going to school, being bullied about their hijab with the recent... Uh, issues that are happening in the UK about ripping you know, the hijab of their ripping heads. the hijabs off the head in certain schools all over Europe, not just in the UK. I wouldn't blame, to be honest with you, I, I can't blame them if they, if they feel depressed and they feel anxious and they, they start having these, you know, these, these thoughts that are coming up in their suicidal heads. Suicidal thoughts. Or not just suicidal yeah. thoughts, maybe cutting themselves or hurting themselves to relieve the stress that they have or, you know, the, the pain that they have inside them. I could never relate to it. I, I, I don't wear a hijab. I don't think I'll ever wear a hijab, by the way. But I can never relate to it. But I, it must be really tough for them going to school every day. Yeah. And then, you know, you are the odd one out. You are different. Do you get me? Yeah. I mean, I, I, I'm, I look different. I might not look like the classmates, but at least, you know, I'm a boy. I can talk like them. I can hang out with them. For a girl, it's very different. I think the, 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 the main thing is that we need to kind of look at it as, 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 as not a mental health. I mean, when I say mental health issue, it, is a, it, it becomes a mental health issue. But especially in the Iraq community, we look at it, oh, they're crazy. Yeah. You know, we, we label it. Yeah. As, as a crazy person, yeah, the when actually it's not a crazy person, it's a normal, everybody in, in, in their life we all go can through go through temporal that. phases, yeah. right? Temporary you can phases, become sorry. anxious for a certain, you can go into a de depressing mode in a certain period of your life and then get out of it because of the help of your, your friends, your family or the help of the religion. You know, you, you know you, I used to be the type of person that 
Ali Madani just uh, outlined, like, I thought people just made up stuff that they were stressed just to get off work. You know, when I would see people be off work for like weeks on end, I'm like, what's wrong with them? Oh, they're, you know, suffering from stress and depression and what have you. And I'm like, okay, that's interesting. Until you actually, like you said, phases, right? It's when a lot of sensitive, delicate situations arise all at the same time and they come and attack you from all angles. Mm. You're already going through your own stuff. Then you have to worry about family members. Then you have to worry about immigration. Then you have to worry about all these other things. And you're at, you're at a deadline. Then you have a job as well. That's the funny thing about life. Suddenly there's nothing wrong. Suddenly everything everything's exactly wrong. Yeah. And then you're thinking, why am I so sad? Why don't I want to wake up? Why don't you don't know you're actually beginning to suffer from some effects of depression and, and all these things. And you don't know it. Yeah. You don't know it. And I think I'm actually I feel we, we all are uh, living in a Western society such as Britain, where they have so much awareness and it's ongoing and it's spreading. And they have so many of these sort of programs and forums in which you can take advantage of to come and talk. And, and, and the first thing, if you do go, the first thing they say, well, thank you for coming. That's the very first thing. You know, you'd be surprised how many people actually are going through this day in and day out, but they're, they're not taking the effort to make an appointment to call in and just come talk to us. <coughs> and why, why I really that? recommend that. Why do, you, why do you think people don't? Similar to what you guys said, you feel weak. It's like a stigma attached to it. You feel like you're not normal, you're abnormal. It's a, it's a mental disorder, let's not forget. Just like you're cold, but it's physical. You can see the nose running when you have a flu. This stuff is happening internally. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you, the doctors and the professionals can see your effects on the yeah, outside externally. It's like, I, I, mate, I, what's I, wrong with I you? I totally agree with you in one sense that, especially in this country, we do have great uh, awareness for mental health issues. We do have a big um, kind of campaign from the NHS and stuff, which is very, very positive. But then the other side of the coin, is, I don't know if it's like what popular culture embeds in our head or something, you always put that question mark on, on, in your head when you know that somebody's feeling depressed because it, it, it doesn't answer a question, it opens up a thousand other questions. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. So there's always going to be that kind of, and you know, humans, they just fear what they don't understand anyway. Does that make sense? Yeah. So when, in terms of anxiety, I mean, if you think about it, not only the, the, the example you gave of... Um, What's it called? Of um, the hijab. hijab. Anyone. Mm. When you leave primary school, you get into secondary school, you're very anxious as a youth because when you're in year six, you're the top dog. You're the oldest student in the school. Everyone's below you and looks up to you. Suddenly, you just change schools. You're the youngest kid. You're like the tadpole in the pool. Everyone else is the big frog. You're looking around. You're very scared. Now, imagine these children. On the first day of school, a big year 10 guy comes and picks them up, throws them in the bin, flushes their head down the toilet, does something. What happens is, no, no, seriously, what happens is you will always associate taking those steps, walking into this building with that thing that happened to you first. Even three years down the line, it will always be in the back of your mind. So if, beca if that becomes constant, think about it. You're not happy. You, you're forced to go to school whether you like it or not, you know, you know what I mean? Uh, you're scared to tell your parents because your parents will think, oh, what's wrong with my son? Oh, da, da, da. Or, or you don't want it to be even a bigger problem. You don't want more people to find out, Yeah. for example. So you keep it in. Now that you've kept it in, it starts burning inside you. It starts burning inside you. It builds up. You feel trapped. Yeah. Slowly, slowly, you know, this is how shaitan comes to you mm. and gives you even more evil and poisonous thoughts. It's a really, really sad thing, actually. And, you know, <clears throat> it's very difficult to deal with in society because... Children are, as we call them in Arabic, jahal, comes from jahal. They don't, they're ignorant. They don't understand these things. You can have such a negative impact on a person's life from a young age, and they can hold that for the rest of their lives. So, so someone who gets bullied in school, suddenly they have a bad temper when they're older because they lash out, because they, they've kept all that negative energy inside of them for so long. And that becomes really, really sad because... Sometimes they reach a point in their lives where it becomes very difficult to change. So what's the difference between, you, you mentioned something, you said when they go from year 6 to year 7 or from yeah. year 11 to uni yeah. or college, sorry. Um, what's the difference between anxiety and depression? Because they're two different key terms, right? Yeah, basically anxiety, this is my understanding, is a fear of something bad about to happen 
whether that's going to happen or not. And anxiety is a killer. You know, we, I don't know about you guys, but some forms of anxiety does hit me, I'll be honest. And it doesn't even turn out that way. I'm thinking, oh, this is going to happen, that's going to happen. But it doesn't. But at that moment in time, I feel a weight mm. on top of me, like a burden. And it's not going away. Now, I have been trying to kind of just maybe read more of the Quran and stuff like that. And it is helping because I, I don't believe in <clears> pills. <throat> I don't want to take a pill. I want to get addicted to a pill. Addiction is a different topic <clears throat> altogether. So, um, but yeah, all forms of anxiety. But you, you got to like keep it in OCD, control. For example, yeah, yeah. how that develops. Uh, say, I'll give you an example. Yeah. GCSE most important day of your life, you go in for the maths exam. What are you feeling before? Nervous, right? You're feeling anxious. Uh, you start to think, what's the worst that could happen? Yeah. Right? But then, this is what's worse, al khannas The worst that can happen starts to become bigger. Bigger problem, bigger problem. Suddenly you feel trapped. If you don't do really good, it's going to be over. What's going to happen? Your parents are going to be disappointed from you. No, your parents are going to disown you. No, your parents are going to hate you. No, you're not going to have a good future. No, you're going to da 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 it destroys you, right? Yeah. Mm. And that grows, grows, grows. And that's how like, you know, OCD starts to happen. You, you become extra with a specific thing. You want to do this. You become twitchy. <laughs> and, and, no, it's not even about twitchy. You're normal, but you want to do this over and over again. Why? Because, you know, you're not sure if you did it right. You're not sure if you did it right. right. Perfection. Yes. You have self-doubt. Yeah. You have self-doubt. And you're always nervous about things. You're always anxious. And that really can destroy a person. Bro, and that's why, you know, having a, a waswas is haram. And if you feel like you have it, you've done wudu, and then you say, should I do wudu again? No. The scholars tell you don't. You have to beat that waswas because that can kill you, that can destroy you. And there's a lot of cases where normal people sometimes, for example, I know a person, very nice, successful person, moved from his family to another country for work. Those hours he spent alone in his room after finished work, made him think a lot about different things, made him think about a lot of different things, and he built that. And I'm telling you, this guy's a great guy. And he actually told me about his journey. He said, nothing helped me more than speaking about my problem. And him specifically, he spoke about it with a scholar. Now, you don't always have to speak with a scholar. I'll be honest with you, speaking with a psychiatrist can help a lot. But just speaking about anxiety, bro, he literally, Spent, he told me, like, I spent hours once with the tap open, crying, because I just kept redoing my wudu. Whoa. He's like, some, I, I didn't have, you know, anyone That's to talk severe. to me. That's a severe case of anxiety. And, and you know, the thing is, he, he never had it. He never had it. So look how it builds up. Wow. And it can build up really quickly. Mm. And, for example, it built up in a month, two months. It took him two years to defeat it. So you kind of nip it in, you have to nip it in the bud because you don't know what you can do. Now in terms of depression, depression is another killer to be honest with you. Yeah. It's when you're always feeling down, when you start to hate yourself, when you start to hate everything around Spending you. Spending longer hours in bed, you don't want to get yeah, up, just demotivated. Your What's, right? the What's the point? What's the point? And this is another yeah. one where the shaitan plays on your head. What is the point of life? We're all going to end up dying anyway. We're all going to do this and that. <laughs> Why are you going to do, and you end up doing nothing. You end up being sad. You, you or you go through like your... a personal, like someone close to you dying or something like that. It's a long-term sadness. Yes. Yeah. It just yeah. doesn't go and it's there. sorrow. It's, it's big. It's heavy on the heart. Have you ever heard someone say, you know, I feel heavy-hearted? Mm -hmm. Like there's someone standing on your chest? Yes. It's the worst feeling in the world. And the problem is one in four people have it, right? So, so many people are suffering from it. Think about the ones who don't know they're suffering from it. Think about the ones who know but don't want to say. Think about the ones who don't know how to deal with it. So... And I think this is why it goes back to, for example, when Ahl Bayt Ahmed Sayyid said, Ahmed Akhak ala Sabi'in Mahmel, make 70 excuses for people. Because really, in life, we don't know what other people are going through. Yeah, no doubt. Yeah. Like, even when you're in the car and you see the guys driving slow, don't be straight away, beep, 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 beep. Maybe it's an old man in front of you, maybe something else. Yeah. Maybe he's looking for directions. Sure. Well, it's the same kind of concept applies throughout life. It's, it's very, uh, yeah, sorry, just to interrupt you there, Sayyid. Um, about the whole anxiety kind of feeling and I used to have that a lot when I was young um, You know preparing for an exam prepare, Just going to school by itself I, Alhamdulillah, I'm not saying that I was bullied or anything Seriously, not my big voice You were bullied, he uh, bullied <laughs> But I had that struggle inside of me I was like, I don't feel like it You know, I don't want to I just don't want like it I don't want to be there And then exam would come I don't like the exam I don't want to study for it And then 
it would happen and then I'm not well prepared, I'm so anxious, you know, maybe I'm going to fail, maybe something's going to happen. And I had this for quite a long time. Mm. Um, and obviously, you know, you listen to lectures, you know, Islam tackles it very nicely, actually. But you listen to these lectures and they, they sometimes, you know, I'm not saying they come in one, they go in one ear, come out the other ear, but you just, sometimes it just doesn't sink in. You don't get the picture of how do I battle, how can I fight this anxious feeling that I have. I'm always anxious, I'm always, you know, worried something's going to happen. Um, and this funny thing happened to me, I was actually on holiday and I was sitting with a, a family relative and we were sitting in a, I still remember the whole scene. It was a nice area in the middle of the, uh, of like a, um, next to the, like a, a little river flowing and we're sitting there and I just opened my heart. So we're just talking and then I told my cousin, I told them, listen, yeah, you know, I'm always a bit like, you know, anxious about things. And then he said something, I've heard this many times, you know, you know, you hear this so often, but then the way he said it at that time and at that atmosphere, it really made sense to me there. And then I was like, yeah, you're right. You know, why, did, why am I so worried about stuff? I mean, what's going to happen? I just remember Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and my heart will calm down. I will be, I'll, I'll build normal. And that's the truth of it. And it's truth. You know, depression you, and anxiety comes from the devil. Exactly. Yeah. You read, sometimes you read Ayatul Kursi before you're doing your exam. You can read it 100 times and you're still like, oh, I'm still shaking, you know, am I going to fail? But you just like, uh, you read it once and uh, you know, Allah will make me, you believe that, you actually you reminded believe it. me of a and personal experience. And it will calm you down. Yeah. And you feel like, wow, mm. you know, subhanAllah. I was uh, looking for, so during my uh, journey at u uni, one of the things I needed to do was look for an internship. And I knew that if I didn't get this internship, it wouldn't be great for my future career. Um, and I didn't have a bad CV. My CV was actually quite good. Ali knows I've been working from a very young age. And my, my grades are not bad. Uh, you know, I, I don't yeah. think anything's All wrong right, with man. me. All right, yeah. man. That's a Come back you know, from that you <laughs> Lots of F's and D's on my issue. <laughs> <laughs> uh, F stands for fantastic. <laughs> <laughs> um, point is, I kept getting rejections. And I'm not lying to you. I made over 50 applications. And you were rejected in all of them? I was rejected in the majority. Peak. Yeah. Um, that's from the initial application. Not even interview, nothing. So then obviously I noticed there was, you know, issues with, you know, there were problems with how I was doing the application and things like that. Um, but throughout that whole period, I was worried. My exams were coming up. My no internship is secured. Other people who I know haven't, you know, haven't, don't have any experience are getting jobs. So I was so like worried, you know, yeah. what's going to happen? And you said it very nicely. One thing I was told by my father, I think, at the time, and uh, he said, you need to take a back seat. You, you can't do all the driving. And he goes, you can't do all the driving. You need to take a back seat, let Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala do what he does best, and I took a back seat, I focused, I started to re actually reflect upon each and every application that I'm doing, start focusing on it. And subhanAllah, made the, the next 10 applications, I got acceptances, I went to the interviews, and I started rejecting them after nice. they gave me offers. Yeah. Only because I turned it into something else. But the point is... So here, big headed, he started rejecting them. Just remember how he said that. <laughs> can, can we just know that? that? <laughs> <laughs> Rasul sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, um, if I remember correctly, the, in the, I remember the context. Paraphrase. He says there are three things that uh, harden your heart. Um, I was mentioned two of them. Tarakum um, with bi ala then. So the um, when when a when, when a, a sin goes on with another sin and you keep sinning, just keep, you keep sinning. Okay. And the other thing is al musahabatul mauta. So uh, being friends with the dead. What does this mean? What does he mean by the dead? It means people who are after everything that is materialistic. Yes. People that have no sort of um, Spiritual glare to them, sure. you know, someone with. Just walking you know, I can look at corpus. Ali honestly. I can look at certain people and I can see there's noor. a glimpse of noor. Yeah. Like it's, it's, they are comfortable to be around. Imam Zain al-Abidin, what does he say? And that we read this du'a. Hopefully, we read it all the time, but we usually read it 
in Shah Ramadan, he says, Feed uh, Dua Abi Hamza Thamali. Um, Amra Aitani, um, let, me, let me remember it. When he says that, uh, do you see me not um, in, uh, associating myself with the ulama? So you rejected me. So you're, so you're dissociating yourself from good people. You associate yourself with the wrong people. What does this do? This hardens your heart. Yeah. This pushes you away from have, seeing Allah subhanahu wa Modern ta'ala scholars, like Orientalists, uh, not Islamic scholars, what do they say? Positive energy. Yeah. Always go for positive energy. And saying, if you look, it's kind of the same thing as what you're saying. Uh, of course, the ilm of the Imams is uh, second to none. But look at what, what, what they're coming up with now is things we had 1400 years ago. Uh, being in a positive atmosphere, being with positive people is very, very important. But this is beautiful what, what, what Sayyid is saying. In terms of Dua Abi Hamza Thamali, just as a side note, that is the most beautiful Dua, I think, yes. ever. And it just speaks about everything in your life. And anyone who hasn't read it, they should read it, to be honest. Um, there, I'll tell you something. I'm, I'm terrified of flying. I'm, oh, are you? Yeah, I've got vertigo and I'm terrified of heights. Like... I didn't know that. Yeah. And I'll, t I'll tell you, first I'll tell you a funny story. On my honeymoon, I was uh, with my wife, we saw a fun fair, not a fun fair, it's like a, a theme okay. park, a theme park. Okay. Actually, no, an actual theme park okay. in the city we were in. So we went there. And imagine this is my honeymoon, and, you know, we just got to know my wife and she likes roller coasters. She's like, let's go on this big roller coaster. And I'm I thinking. I should have known that before. <laughs> <laughs> I'm thinking. You didn't uh, specify that in the nikah. <laughs> there's something I need to tell you. Um, I don't know what I did. I don't know why I did it, but I was like, yeah, let's go on this roller coaster. <laughs> uh, needless to say, when we came down from the roller coaster, she said, I don't think we should ever go on a roller coaster again. <laughs> Flying. I, 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 I have a. I, 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 I'm. It's over for me. Like, how, I'm, how do you do it? How do you handle that? I'll tell you. Um, a few years ago, my mom gave me this little book um, that has little dua in it. One of them is called Al Hiraz Thamanun Ayah. The the uh, the thing that keeps you safe, uh, specific eighty ayahs in the Quran. <laughs> I can't remember all eighty, but some of them are Allah yaf al ma So God will do what He wants. So we're in the hands of God. Allah Allahu khayru hafadhu. Allahu khayru hafadhu. Huwa arham al So Allah subhanahu wa taala is the best of protectors. Ahsent. One of them was. Bro, I would read this 80 ayahs of Hiraz and I'd keep it next to my heart and I'd say, God, I'm with you now. And honest to God, I'm not saying this because I'm a very religious person or something, but this is not me, this is the power of the, the dhikr of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Bro, let me tell you, when I say I'm terrified, I mean I'm terrified. If I'm on a tall building, if I look down, I just get... My head starts spinning, sure. that kind of thing. But when I read this, when I when I feel I'm getting closer to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, it really, really, really moves everything. Because whether I die or not, it, it just helps me. Reading those 80 ayahs, and you know what, I'll send them to you. Yeah, uh, that's good. They're, they're, yeah, they're actually very nice. Reminds me of everything in life. We need Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. We might not realize it sometimes, living in this materialistic life that we live. But we need him so badly. And even mentioning his name yeah. is a cure for our hearts. It's, 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 it's a cure for our hearts. So we need to understand that these uh, problems like depression and anxiety, whatever the reason started for them, they get built up by shaitan. So, so from an Islamic perspective, I don't know from a, psycho, a psychoanalysis perspective, but from an Islamic perspective, the best way to beat this is from the early stages growing closer to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Sure. And I mean that. Really, really, really thinking about everything. Because this is the thing, right? What's the worst thing that can happen? The total worst thing is we can die. In anything, right? Yeah. When we take an exam, I'm going on a plane. What's the worst thing that can happen? I can die, right? There's nothing worse than that, right? Take an exam. From anything, right? <laughs> no, I'm saying, you know how it builds up? Oh, this is gonna happen. What's the worst thing that can happen? Yeah. The, always the thing, Everything the ceiling. Stops there. Yeah. All right, but when I'm close to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, it's like the Ashab of Imam al Hussein. Yes. Death, it's, what they were it's winning. Yeah. 
It's our success. Why? Because we're close to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So if the worst possible thing of anything that I do in my life is me going to be I think dying, yeah. but my it's mind frame as well, I'm close to Allah, let me die. It's nice how you mentioned that. You know, does, that, does, that does that make sense? Or? Absolutely. If you, if you put in your intention for everything you do, you know, I think it was Imam Ali said, said this, uh, um, I, in everything I do, I put Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala before it and after it, in every de- act I, I do. So if you do anything you do, you need to tawakkul ala Allah. My niyyah, my intention is to do it qurbatan Allah, closeness to Allah. I take this exam, closeness, you say, how do you relate an exam to getting closeness to Allah? There is, there is a relation there. Because I'm seeking knowledge here. I'm getting closer to Allah. And that helps. And that helps you. Anxiety and Exactly, and it beats everything. Because everything you do is qurbatan Allah ta'ala. If God wants it, you know, He will accept it. And if you do come to die, you're doing it in the name of Allah. You'll die. Hadi, do you Hadi. remember when we were in Qom? This reminded me of something. We, we, me and Sayyid Hadi, we've traveled many times together. In 2012, we went to Qom together. And one of the scholars we were with gave me something beautiful. He's like, really, everything to do with life is how you look at it. This cup of water, I can drink this cup of water and gain more thawab than if I hold a majlis. I said, why? He said, because if my niya is so pure that I'm going to drink this cup of water to be able to have the strength to get up and do ibadah for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, the, the hasanat of that might be more than me doing a majlis because I want to show off, oh, for yeah. example. Do you know what I'm saying? Or I want to stand at the door and say hello to people. So really our, no, you know what I'm saying? I know exactly our, what our, 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 But that really, really took me back and thought mm-hmm. every single one of our actions, and this, I think this is how Ahl Bayt actually practically live their life. Not from a the- theoretical standpoint, but there's a practice. Everything they do is, is not um, just I'm doing this for no reason. There's a reason mm. for everything they did. And always their reason is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. The ibadah of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and, 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 and making Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala pleased with them. And these are of course the immaculates, the Ahl Bayt Who are we compared to them, right? But if we just put that in the back of our minds, you can defeat shaitan, you can defeat your depressions, you can defeat your anxiety. Of course, when we say it like that, that's theoretical. But from a, from a from practical aspect, I feel depressed about this. I feel um, anxious about this. Get up and pray to Yeah. But some people feel, say, that's the thing. Some people, they, they, they feel like, you know, when you, you know when you want to get up to pray yeah. and you just feel heaviness and you just don't want to get up and... So when you give them the diagnosis is to get up and pray, it goes against, you know... How they're feeling what, at the time. Yeah, yeah, so I think what we... I, mean, which I agree with you, by the way. But I think f- just to take that kind of person into account and see how he can... No, you're right, on, you're right. Um, it goes back to our personal actions, I think. Uh, Surah Al-Hashr, Ayah 7. It says, فَلَمَّا زَاغُوا أَزَاغَ اللَّهُ Sorry, um, it's, there is an ayah, I don't think it's al-hashr. Al-hashr ayah 7 is nasu Allah fa'ansahum and fusahum. They forgot Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, so he made them forget themselves. So when you forget your nafs, when you forget yourself, then you will forget your Lord, you'll forget your priorities your you'll fig- and this is when you go into insomnia and you go into um, so I think the key is to always be conscious of God your wearing. actions, God wearing ahsent. Be God wearing of what you're doing. You know, said said it nicely, you said it nicely as well. Have the intention to do everything for the you know, to get to see closeness to Allah. Said, you just made a beautiful point and I want I want to call you out on this point because perhaps we could just discuss this even briefly and it could be beneficial to you a lot of people. From a practical standpoint, someone who is forgetting themselves and forgetting Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and is in this kind of downward spiral, yeah. practically what would you do to help them? If, if, if you know telling them get up and pray, they'll be like, you know what I mean? So what, what would you do? How would you rem- remind them that they need to do dhikr? How would you remind them that they need to do get, seek closeness? Because that, as you said, goes against what their mind frame is at that time. So what's the actual practical thing of... Moving forward, what would you say? Or what would any of you guys say? Uh, I mean, can I just say oh, something very quick? Uh, it's very hard. It is very hard. You yeah, can't yes. tell someone to switch or to, to become, you know, think of Allah the whole time. I mean, you can't. You, sometimes you're just not used, you're not into that kind of 
atmosphere or into that kind of way of living. But what I found from, from my personal point of view is that the best period of time to do this, I'm not saying so leave it, but in Ramadan was the perfect yeah. time for me. When you're fasting, yeah, yeah. When you're fasting, because you are already fasting the whole day. You are God awareness of God the whole time. You're not eating, you're not drinking, you, you're not lying, you try not to backbite, which is very hard. But you know, you're aware of all of these things the whole time. This is the view of our religion, yes. It's beautiful. And then come after iftar, you have your amal, you have your du'as, you know. Du'a wa Hamza Thamali, you have, you know, all these ad'ayah that you read every day. When you do that for 30 days, after the 30 days, you're kind of used to it. I'm not, I'm not, I'm not saying do it because you're used to it. Yeah. No, because you're already used to it's it. It has an effect on you. It has an effect yeah. on you. you. It's easier for you then to stick with it and continue with it. Don't just leave it. Don't drop it. Don't say, okay, Ramadan is finished. I'm going to go back to how, how I used to live my, my, my life. But you're kind of used to it already. Continue with it. And you'll find that within those 30 days, after Ramadan, even though it's, it's, it's hard to wake up before Salat al-Fajr, to pray Salat al-Layl, you are used to it because you're doing it in the time of suhoor. Mm -hmm. You're getting up, you pray Salat al-Layl and then Salat al-Fajr. For you, it becomes easier. When you get into, into it and you're used to it, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is always behind, in, your, in the back of your head. You know, everything you do, you're at work, you're working. You know, you're not fasting, you're working after Ramadan. You'd, oh, oh, Salah, Salah is in five, ten minutes. Okay, stop. Go and get ready for prayers because you're, you're aware of it. Yeah. You used to do it in Ramadan, after Ramadan, do the same so thing. So, you're basically saying do it in the month of Ramadan, basically. I'm not just saying just wait for the month of yeah. Ramadan. I'm saying but in if the it month is, of Ramadan, it's a perfect time. It's a perfect time. To start I agree, totally agree doing with you. It. it will teach you. Yeah. But, I mean, like what the brother just asked, how do you get someone to do it? One option is doing it in the month of Ramadan. Um, I really don't have an answer for that. I actually want to go a bit further because what you guys are doing is you're giving solutions, which is fantastic. But if we go a bit further back to the other end of the spectrum, there's people who are so ignorant that they don't even know that they're kind of on this issue is happening to them and they're just dealing with it. They're acting really strange because of it. I mean, going back to what I was saying, how we're so lucky to be in a society which understands this and kind of promotes this. Even at workplace, they have like special sessions where you can go to even for free and HR, stuff. Uh, HR everywhere. Yeah, yeah. Exactly. No, it's fantastic. Take that. On the opposite end of the spectrum, a country where I'm originally from, my parents, Pakistan, and people who are be behaving a bit funny, abnormal, what happens to them? They yeah, take them to at. the, they t yes, laughed at, uh, bullied, mocked, and how do you cure them? You take them to the witch doctor who gets a voodoo doll, uh, starts spilling stuff on you, and then apparently you're cured because there were seven witches inside you and jinns and all this stuff and th there's absolutely nothing medically wrong with you there was just like issues with poltergeists and stuff like that because that's the level of Whoa. ignorance <laughs> Whoa. do you know what i mean i mean they think you're not normal there must be something the inside you inside the jinn inside you and that is complete contrast to what the society we've been brought up in is something's wrong with you no there's a medical answer for it first and foremost yeah and i know people who are suffering through depression and they're just refusing and then another thing is refusing to take benefit and help from people, assistance from people. They'll just stay in their room, you know. They're perfectly normal people. When you begin to talk to them, they're perfectly yeah, fine. Yeah, but when you yeah. hear about them, he hasn't left his room in the last 10 years. You know, I mean, not every day, but he comes out, That's just eats, do, goes back, maybe goes out for a bit of a drive. And they're perfectly normal people. They can drive as well. It's not like they're not capable, but... Ali, do you think... Do you think ev these I mean, people who go through depression, do you think they don't want to talk to people or people don't give them a chance to talk to them. Because I believe there's a, there are a lot of people who, you know, I may fall into the trap of it might be a bit doing of that. Yeah, because mm -hmm. I could sometimes, you know, see someone, he's being so, you know, trying to be close to me and I'm speaking to him and everything mm -hmm. like that. But I just don't, th I don't process it, you know, I just think he's just yeah. another person I'm talking so, to. You know, you know, it's just a social can't. setting that we're in, we're talking. But I don't see that this person may need help. But saying that, you know, what I, I realized from talking to the, from the two points the brothers made is, I don't think there is one set way that we can help people, or from a practical aspect, nor do I think that it's that easy. But what I think that we can do as a society, as a community, is be more open to these kind of yes. situations, yes. be more caring, be more understanding, and uh, create an atmosphere, a positive atmosphere, that when someone is going through depression, 
they don't mind coming and t talking to us about it, talking to anyone about it, because it's something normal. Stop making them feel like they're outsiders. So that's a society. That's as a society what we could do. From a personal level, I think at the end of the day, no one's the wiser. Nobody can make someone do something, but perhaps we can inspire them from a simple story, from anything, and then the rest is up to them. But as long as society is ready to accept it, inshallah, they'll be able to inshallah, be helped. Yeah. And as long as from or far from close, we just inspire them. Because yeah. you know, sometimes some, a word can inspire someone exactly. or a story. Yeah. And we hope, and the most important thing, of course, is dua, dua, dua. Yeah. Pray for yourselves, pray for your neighbors, pray for the community, pray for society, pray for the world. And inshallah, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala blesses everyone. Inshallah. From a personal perspective, sorry, just to add to your. Because I really want to order food, yeah. go on. <laughs> From a personal perspective, the person should always, first. the first thing they should do is acknowledge that they have. That's it. You have to come to terms with that. And there are there are out there, um, you know, a li there's a list of diagnoses. You know, how do you know that you have it? If you fall into five of these, um, you know, of these five of of the ten sort of um, criteria, ten, ten criteria. If you yeah. fall into five of them, you should seek help. You should, seek help. You should always do that. And then so, there's a hadith so which Google says, a min ibadah. <laughs> They always say yoga, I think, helps get rid of anxiety and stuff. But our Ahlul Bayt, what do they beautifully say? One hour of reflection is better than a year's worth of worship.